Hey, what's your date of birth? August 20th, 24. Where were you born? In Cleveland, Somerset, England. West of London, um, about 150 miles okay. between London and Bristol. Started school at four years old, ah. which is a bit unusual. Yeah. Uh, my birthday was the 20th, and I started school September the 1st. And it's a church school run by two ladies, two classrooms, pot belly stove, and um, um, stayed there until I went to high school, yeah. And you did high school in that same area? And Yeah, in a Cleveland, it was called a Cleveland Secondary School. England wasn't prepared mm -hmm. for war. They had territorial troops who were volunteers, but minor, not very many of them. Right. And um, uh, when the war started, I don't think they were prepared to go to war. And um, it was to get as many people in the army as you could. Uh, the first thing would be the fact that the local civil defense wanted volunteers, and I was in the uh, Boy Scouts, so they took the scouts as volunteers, and they were the victims. And then the um, firemen and the ambulance people put bandages on them. And it was prior to the war starting, but they were preparing for civil defense. Was there an aha moment where all of a sudden, where you're living outside of London, uh, it struck you that Gee, we're at war. Uh, yeah, the bombing of, of England. And um, every night they came over probably 80 to 100 bombers at a time to bomb London and major cities like Bristol, Coventry, and um, did a lot of damage, killed a lot of people, um, civilians, who were innocent victims of this terrible thing they were doing. They were out to bomb the docks in London but they bombed everybody, and uh, indiscriminate bombing, yeah. yeah. Did you in Somerset, did you, did, how did that impact you guys? We had some bombing, yeah, limited number, yeah. yeah. But they also mined the channel, the Bristol Channel was mined by the Germans. Uh, there was a German plane crashed on the um, beach in Cleveland. Hmm. How did they mine the uh, the channel? Did uh, by parachute. Parachute mines, yeah. Wow. Dropped them by parachute. And then they floated in the channel, yeah. yeah. Probably hit me um, when I was about 17, 17 and a half. Um, and then I volunteered to join the um, Royal Air Force. Mm -hmm. I volunteered because I wanted to be in the Air Force. And if you were called up, um, you could be put into any service. Not only could you be put into any service, you could be put into any job. They could call you up and say, you're going in the army, you could be a cook. And you know nothing about cooking. But that was what they did. So I volunteered for the Air Force, and then I spent quite a time in England and um, Scotland training to be a um, uh, wireless operator, air gunner. That was my job. I did um, wireless training, um, air gunnery training. Um, I can't remember the exact time, but enough to, to qualify you. And you'd have a qualification. Well, you'd have an AG badge, mm -hmm. air gunner badge. Do any air missions over Germany or over? Germany? No, and my air missions were in Italy and Greece. Oh, Italy, Greece, North Africa. Oh. I did time in Egypt. We didn't have the extreme bombing, but we had some bombs, and of course the other thing would be the blackout. Mm -hmm. Every every light had to be blacked out, right. and you couldn't show a light anywhere. The lights on the cars were dimmed, and so they didn't show the glare and um, difficult to get around. Well, when I was fully trained, um, we were sent to, um, on a <clears throat> boat to um, Egypt, arrived in Egypt, um, which is something entirely different than anything you can imagine. It's a very poor country, very hot country, uh, flies and poor people. And of course, the Egyptians didn't like the English. And, um, also, I went to Israel, but it wasn't called Israel. Now, a lot of people don't know this. 
it was British mandated territory controlled by the British. Yeah. Uh, maybe you've heard that or yeah. know of it. Yeah. Um, and the, the British, they weren't soldiers, but they wore a brown uniform and a black peak cap, and they were controlling the whole of, the, uh, of Israel. Huh. The Israelis hated them because they wouldn't allow any immigrants to come in to Israel from Europe. And um, there were boatloads waiting off the coast to come in and the British wouldn't allow it. The Israelis did not get their... Um, to be controlling themselves until 1948. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when I was there, it was a very difficult time for anybody in British uniform. Uh, so anyway, and then we went to the coast to a place called Ein Shamir and did some training and then we went to um, Italy and I was flying in um, Wellington's twin engine bombers yeah. Yeah. Wellington bombers in, in Italy um, and what was your again your assignment there in the, the Wellington uh, we were bombing bridges bombing German positions um, stop the Germans from retreating um, they were retreating. Rome was still in German hands at that time and to stop them retreating north and um, we were on one side of the aerodrome and on the other was an American um, uh, liberator squadron and they were doing the Ploesti oil field raids in oh Romania you probably remember that yes Anyway, they were they were bombed there, and they, and we were bombing locally. And then on the um, reinvasion, we went to Greece. In fact, we arrived in Greece before the paratroopers arrived. Ah, wow. <laughs> Landed at Kalamaki, which was the um, Greek aerodrome uh, near Athens, and um, we were there quite a while again, bombing in northern Greece and uh, Yugoslavia to stop the Germans. From retreating and then we um, we stayed there because you might remember this um, the communists rose up against the um, Greeks I stayed on in Greece um, we were staying in a local house and um, um, we then helped the um, and Churchill flew to Athens and talked to the um, it was a, a Greek Orthodox mm -hmm. minister mm -hmm. and um, I can't remember his name. That's an inside story. Um, uh, we were staying in a, a Greek house um, in Athens and um, most of the Greek houses have a flat roof with a parapet around and you can go up on the roof and look around. And um, anyway, the owner of the Greek was a little old lady who lived in the basement. And we took over the house from the Germans. They had left the house very oh, a week before and we took over and, and moved in. And um, anyway, her granddaughter came to see her from way over the other side of Athens. And um, um, it was getting late and I said to the... I'm, she could speak a little English. The girl couldn't speak any English. And I said, I'll take her home. I, bear with me. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, I took the granddaughter home to her mother, who lived way over there in a house over the back of some common land. And um, went in the house. The mother offered me the, uh, a biscuit and some water to drink. The hospitality of the house, which you can't refuse. And uh, as we were sitting there and trying to communicate, two Greek guerrillas came in. I knew who they were. They had knives and daggers and yeah. looked in German jackboots and wanted to know who I was and how, why were we bombing them and uh, how many planes did we have. And I knew I was in trouble, so I told them, we had 15 planes. I told them we had 60 planes. We were going to bomb the hell out of them. <laughs> and uh, um, and th this is bizarre. And um, so one of them put on an old gramophone playing a record. He gets up and he's dancing with the girl. This is unbelievable. Dancing with the girl. 
and the other one's trying to find out who I am, what I am, and how many troops we have. And, uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And um, finally said, well, I, I've got to go, you know, I can't stay here any longer, I've got to go. And uh, they said, well, all right, go, but don't cause any more trouble. I said, oh no, we're, we're not going to do anything. And um, so then I left, and before I left, I asked them, they had on raincoats, slash kite here, and I thought, and slouch hats, and I said, who are you, who are you? And he said, um, Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> They'd seen films of Humphrey Bogart, and they dressed like Bogart with daggers and, oh. <laughs> and I thought, you know, Joplin, get out of here, you're in trouble, go, while the going's good. And so I, I get out, and I'm stalking the walk across this common land, and what happened, there's a spitfire firing on <laughs> the uh, guerrillas about, oh, a short distance away. And uh, I thought, there's a war going on, you know. And so I watched it, and then somebody said, how do it go there? And it's the British troops are lying there with their rifles pointed at me, wanting to know, what the hell am I doing over here? My and God. the captain comes out, and he says, where the hell are you? You can't go over I, I said, well, I was visiting a girl. Girl, what do you mean a girl? You can't do that. This is the British front line. He said, get the hell out of here and don't ever come back. So you were ahead of the British front line. I love it. I was ahead of everybody. So while you are in the Wellington and you're, you're out doing a variety of bombing raids, did you get a lot of resistance? Was there a lot of German? Um, we were shot out a few times by a 109, yeah, a fighter, German fighter. Um, um, now the Wellington bomber was uh, unique, it had geodetic construction and it was canvas covered, which is unusual, and if you get hit in the side, the canvas will peel right back to the turret. Often we did many things besides bombing, we used to do um, illumination, the army would say, well we're fighting the German, we want to illuminate an area. So we have magnesium flares. Now usually in the plane you carry two. Never use them, but carry two. So to illuminate the area <clears throat> for the armor, we took off with 35. Now these, magne they're a million candle power per unit. Yeah, so if they ever hit the plane, it would go off in a great big fireball. And my job was to put them in the flare chute and trip it, and they go out the cap would come off, the spinner would go around, and the parachute would come out, and they'd float down and illuminate the area. That was the purpose of doing that. And um, that was one of my jobs. What was the closest call you had during the war? Um, crash landing. Where? In, in Greece. What? Came back from a mission. We uh, were you shot up or what? Uh, there was shot. Yeah, they shot up the plane. Uh, I was in the rear turret. And I was fine. Um, but damaged one of the engines, so we came and crash landed. And everybody was injured in some way. I I broke an arm, and um, others had broken bones. And um, did the plane catch fire? Or? No, no, didn't oh, catch fire. Very, very lucky, yeah. He trained by flying out across the Irish Sea. Oh, that was true. Oh, yeah. That's First another. day in the ops room, I was told not to forget the birds. I carried birds. You'll never find this anywhere with anybody else, but we had carry, two carrier pigeons in a wicker basket. That was my job, to carry the pigeons. Because we, yeah, now this is serious. <clears throat> Attached to the pigeons, there was a little capsule with a screw top made of aluminum. We carried rice paper, and you would write a message. Now, this is almost impossible. The plane crashes in the sea, and you're supposed to say, sorry, we crashed in the sea, send help, fold it up, put it there, and let the pigeon go, and the pigeon takes it back to headquarters. My job was to look after the pigeons. Now, you didn't feed them, because if you feed them, they'd never go. They'd stay with the plane. Now, you'd never find pigeons anywhere else. Part of what you did was drop a lot of leaflets. Yeah, Greek leaflets, yeah. <clears throat> well, the problem was in Greece, 
uh, when the war, the Germans were moving out, the communication with villages was very poor. The telephone lines were down if they had any. Wireless wasn't very good. And um, so we dropped uh, leaflets written in Greek in packages. I think there were 600 to a package. And <laughs> we'd fly as low as we could over a village and drop the leaflets to them to give them news of the war and what was happening. Uh, that's the only communication they had. There were no newspapers or anything. Um, so we did a lot of leaflet dropping. Started as an AC-2, Aircraftsman 2, and wound up as a W-01, Warrant Officer First Class. That was my major rank. This is the BBC Home Service. We're interrupting programs to make the following announcement. It is understood that in accordance with arrangements between the three great powers, an official announcement will be broadcast by the Prime Minister at three o'clock tomorrow. In view of this fact, tomorrow, Tuesday, will be treated as victory in Europe Day. At some point, you get the word that VE Day was, was, had been announced. How did you get the word and what was your reaction? Uh, I was in Egypt at the time and um, uh, word came that V Day came by um, somebody had a radio, they heard it on a radio. And then they gave the message to us and we celebrated in the mess. And um, glad that the war was over. Um, we didn't have much communication about what was happening in Europe. We didn't know. <coughs> we knew there was D Day, re invasion. But how it was going, we didn't have much news about it until it was all over. Um, so communications were, were poor. Uh, we celebrated with drinking Egyptian beer and smoking um, Indian cigarettes. Uh, the Egyptian beer wasn't bad. The Indian cigarettes were a beer. I think they were made from camel or whatever. <laughs> they were terrible. Oh, there was a meeting in Yalta. Remember that? Churchill yeah, flew to Yalta. Right. Stalin was already there. Um, Roosevelt went by ship. He didn't fly. He went by cruiser and destroyer. It's in the boat. Anyway, the squadron I was with was picked to be bomber escort to President Roosevelt. Really? And so we flew to North Africa to Benghazi, which is yeah. a... Uh, yeah. And we went back, Gauzy. There was a crack. Uh, P 38 squadron, American fighter squadron, came in and they were flying fighter escort and we were flying bomber escort to Roosevelt and um, his entourage. And they were going, I think they were going back from Yalta through the Mediterranean. So we escorted them to. That was my first contact with Americans. Not only that when you hear the war is over, are you glad the war is over, but you want to go home. Right. You want to get home. I was overseas for four years, and in four years I never went home. Ooh, wow. Most of the Americans did. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the American um, B-17 pilots and crew um, after 25 missions went home or had relief. We didn't. We kept flying and stayed overseas for four years. How many missions did you fly all together? 38. Most of them as a tail gunner. I was very, very lucky, thanks to God, that I... Um, if you made seven, you were lucky, and I made a lot more than that. One to seven. You yeah. were. So the, in Egypt, um, there was an older man in the mess. He was a warrant officer. He'd been in Egypt many, many years, served on 36th Squadron, and uh, he wound up with us. And... Um, his specialty was eating glass. And <laughs> you said you wanted the story. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, he'd take a light bulb and he'd set it down and let it cool off and then he'd smash it and break it up into little pieces and then he'd take the pieces and crunch them up and eat them. How he did this, I don't know. But he, Why he did it is another question. I don't even know why and how he got rid of the glass, I don't know either. And the squadron I was on, there were um, Australians uh, a couple of New Zealanders, um, so it was a unique squadron. Um, 
this cook, the Ozes were um, beer drinkers, ah. and they could drink anybody under the table. Those guys, they were, they drank beer all the time. When uh, we were in Greece, um, not affected by the war because the war was further north, and um, an Australian pilot took off one day with a man who was chief engineer, chief mechanic, and another second pilot, and they were going on an air test to test the plane after the mechanics had worked on it, and never came back. Oh my gosh. Crashed in the Mediterranean. We took off and did a square search. Never found him. Never found any wreckage. Nothing. Not an oil slick, debris or anything. They just disappeared. Yeah. Now that, that affects you. Yeah, you're losing a good friend for right. no reason whatsoever. Um, now one thing I did, I prayed when I took off and I prayed when I came home. 